Okay, it looks like everybody's here and I'm sure more will arrive. Um, this is Catherine Lambrecht. Uh, our, our program today, these are like really good friends in one respect, especially like Monica, I have to thank you for getting me into the internet world of food because it was that article on the 24 hour thon that you did 20 some years ago that introduced me to chow hound and all those good things. And I spent weeks reading those things before I asked my first question and it was related to Uncle Remus. And guess who answered it? It was Peter Engler. It's like his bed. And David Hammond, uh, we've, we've been buddies forever, it feels like. Um, we've also done interesting projects. Uh, one was the raccoon project in the sense that we he, he put out the titillating question, you know, how to eat uh, or would you eat the, the, the raccoons that were raiding your garbage, right? What happened there was I had posted on Chowhound that uh, a neighbor of mine was capturing <laughs> raccoons, and I wondered if anyone could butcher the raccoons so we could have a raccoon barbecue, um, <laughs> which led to a dinner at Modo where Amaro Cantu made a roadkill raccoon, I think it was. Yes. Um, remember that? Yeah, that was yep. uh, awesome. And our other adventure was our willingness to cook and eat uh cicadas right. Mm. right oh i know this this there's all sorts of history tonight in, in many funny ways but i'm going to turn it over to you guys because you've written a terrific book which the cover is right there on the screen but you wrote a terrific book about all these iconic foods that people when they come to chicago really ought to give a try i agree thanks so much should i um should we show our faces for a second and your faces say, are being shown right now. Oh, okay, great. And or so, would you like to be side by side? Yeah. Oh, like how does this? Sorry for my uh, ignorance on this. So, uh, so I'll share my screen and show you guys all the pictures of these things. But welcome and thanks for coming out and thanks, Kathy, for having us. Um, Dave and I started this book what three years ago? Uh, yeah, maybe a little more, Monica. Yeah, we lost some time with the pandemic and supply chain issues. Yeah, right. Um, and um, it was it was it started because um, for my jobs at the the Tribune and WBC and Curious City, um, I had been often asked to do stories about the origins of certain Chicago foods. And as I did one after the other, I remember one day um, having lunch with our, our friend Bruce Craig, who is a hot dog historian and, uh, and a food historian in general. And, and he said, you know, you should really put this into a book. And he said, uh, University of Illinois Press has started an imprint where they want to do sort of Midwest culture. And I said, dude, I do not have any time. I got kids who say I never spend time with them. I got editors who are, you know, nipping at my heels for stories. I can't do this. So um, I, I ran into Dave at a party. And Dave, what did I say? You said, oh, my God, if only I could find someone to help me write this book. I think it went something like that. Yeah, yeah right. And then you said, I think I know who could do it. And so we um, we put together the proposal and uh, University of Illinois Press said, all right. And um, then it was just a matter of coming up with uh, a sort of a round number of dishes, creating criteria around it, and then cutting it right down the middle, like a Solomonic thing, like who gets tamales, who gets Italian beef? Um, and, and so that's how we started on this thing. We um, I, I went back to a lot of my previous reporting, and um, and then I did some some more reporting. I wanted to make sure people were still alive and things were still what they were. Um, and um, we each put together our fifteen chapters. Um, hardly ever. See, I think we didn't we didn't see each other during almost the whole writing process, did no. we? <laughs> well, pandemic, yeah. right? I, I mean, I was cowering at home, so. I didn't see much of anybody. You know, it's a, Kathy, I seem to have lost the uh, slide screen. Is that just off at the moment? Uh, well, I figured I put you, highlighted you both. And yeah, it has seemed to have gotten lost. It might be it, it dropped off and we just have to recover it. There okay. we go. Here, so okay, here, good. Yeah, there you go. So, right, so, I should, so, something kind of interesting regarding what Monica was just talking about, interesting to me at least. Um, that Monica had done a lot of research on all these food or many of these foods. And so, and it, she got the assignment. So she had first pick and Monica chose some of the more obscure foods that kind of attracted me to, although I was neutral, I could have gone with anything. 
So I, I ended up getting some of the more common foods, which again, fine with me, like Italian beef and malort and so on. But what's interesting to me is when we go on television, Monica, and talk about this stuff, people want to know about Italian beef and malort. I mean, I, I would think perhaps culinary historians would be more interested in uh, gampong chicken wings and sweet steak and so on. But to the average person who's who hasn't heard of those two more more those more esoteric items, they want to know about the foods they already have had. They want to get the background on it, um, which I find both interesting and frustrating because we never we frequently when we have an hour, you know, sometimes we have like three and a half, four minutes on a on a, a television broadcast, we can only hit the one, you know, the top ones that people want to hear about. And those seem to be the more common ones. Oh, well. Well, for you guys, you're, 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 you know, at the uh, 500 level. So right. we're not going to dwell on the um, super common ones. So let's get this party started. Um, let's start with one of my favorites. Um, at, at all these stops, they always ask us, what's your favorite? We have Puerto Rican. My, my Puerto Rican grandmother helped raise us. Uh, so the jibarito is is my favorite. What's a jibarito? Most of you probably already know. It's a sandwich. It started out as a steak sandwich with uh, American cheese and all these fixings in it. Um, but now you can find everything in it. You can find vegetarian ones. You can find octopus ones. You can find morcilla ones, which I love a lot. That's a blood sausage. Um, and But instead of bread, you get the plantain, the deep fried plantain. And now, David, you've had some pretty old ones, but these should be like super fresh, like searing and crispy and so hot that you can't even touch it right out of the fryer, right out of its second fry, because you want to double fry these. And then always the best ones are smeared with some uh, garlicky, garlic and oil that's been kind of smashed in there. And you should be able to smell it before it even uh, hits your mouth. Um, I love the story of this because it was a down and out guy in, I believe, 1996 at the Borinquen restaurant on California. Um, his name was Juanci um, Figueroa, and he had um, he he'd basically he he said to me, "I was my dad bankrolled a bunch of projects for me. I kept failing, and the the latest one was about to fail. Nobody was coming into my restaurant when I was looking through uh, a, a newspaper called El Bocero." And I saw this recipe for something called a sandwich de platano, and I made it. My dad said, this is good. Put it on the menu. He went to Puerto Rico. By the time dad came back from Puerto Rico, two months later, lines out the door. Everybody wanted the sandwich. And he said, people started copying him. And then he said, okay, you want to play like that? I'm going to give, a, give away a free portion of arroz con gandule with it, which is a rice and pigeon peas. And so they so they had to always give free rice with pigeon peas with this. Now you can find it in dozens of places in Chicago and across the nation. Um, and uh, the jibarito, which means little hillbilly, is uh, my favorite Chicago invented treat. Uh, let's move on to another. And I would just like to, one point, Monica, you had mentioned uh, my less than favorable experience one of the times I went to get the jibarito. It was because the planks of fried plantain were, maybe they'd been sitting around a little too long, so they got hard. So I vowed after that that I would always ask to have the plantains freshly cooked or make sure they were freshly cooked yeah. uh, were before. Like tons of turnover so that they're like yeah. making, like yeah. kibaritos y mas, like they cannot stop making them. Um, so, all right, let's go on to this next one. What the heck is this? Well, this is uh, <laughs> two two funny funny photos. Uh, the one on your le on left of screen is uh, Fat Johnny's, which is a little shack uh, on the far south side in Marquette Park. Uh, Anthony Bourdain was taken there by Peter Engler uh, during uh, I think it was the first season of No Reservations, uh, and they ordered a few different things, including the image you have on the right. Uh, the mother-in-law. Now, this image is not of the mother, the one on the right, is not of the mother-in-law from Fat Johnny's, which looked too awful to put on the screen. It really looked like, it looked like roadkill, really. I mean, it looked like cars had been running over it for a few days before it was served. Uh, it didn't taste bad. This one that we have on the right is from a restaurant called The Hat on North Avenue, which really makes an effort to uh, prepare a presentable looking mother-in-law. Now, the mother, it's a funny name, right? Mother-in-law, where did that come from? Well, I think, I think I may have found the origin of it. And after I, 
after I had already submitted the manuscript, I, I came across some journal that also suggested this is a possibility, although there's an element in there they didn't include. And I'll tell you about it. Whenever I go to Mexico City, I go to the witch's market, which is a part of the Mercado de Sonora, which is a gigantic, I mean, it's unbelievably large market. I mean, it goes on for block after block, I, I, maybe a mile and a half in either direction, big market. There's a, a series of little Quonset huts in back where the witch's market is. And at the witch's market, you can buy uh, uh, amulets, tokens, like wood that has certain properties you burn that will increase you know, your love life or your whatever. Um, and I walked out of it and I, I was hungry and I saw a long line uh, at this one stand right outside the witch's market. And I thought, well, that must be the good place. I'll get in line. I had no idea what I was getting in line for. Uh, but I got to the front and I just said, you know, one of those. And uh, the guy put it together for me. And it was a wajalota, which is a, a torta, a Mexican torta. On a, uh, not really a bolillo. I forget what the name of the bread is. Uh, it, telero. I, I think that's it. It's, it's a circular bread uh, that's cut. And they put a Mexican tamale in there. Not a Chicago corn roll tamale that you see in this photograph here on your right. But a Mexican uh, tamale splashed in uh, salsa verde. And it was really pretty good. I understand that this is mostly a breakfast food because it's just a mass of calories, uh, which is good if you're going to put in a day of work. I later found out that there is a green sauce in Mexico called salsa de suegra, which is mother-in-law sauce. A connection? Not sure. Um, but th that is the most plausible explanation I have for the mother-in-law sandwich. However, there is a joke about it. Monica, you want to say, I'm getting tired of saying this joke. Why do they call it the mother-in-law? Because it can also give you heartburn, but don't bunch. <laughs> Right. Apologies to mother-in-laws everywhere. Um, yeah, that's the um, that's the story. And I, I should just a point about the uh, Chicago corn roll tamale. That's something you'll find at just about every um, Italian beef stand. Uh, many hot dog stands too. Uh, you've probably seen them. They're sold by Tom Tom and Supreme companies. Um, and they're usually, Tom Tom, I believe, still comes in a paper wrapper that's very neatly tied at both ends. Uh, Supreme now puts theirs in a in a plastic bag, which is better for microwaving, which I'm guessing is the way most of these are eaten. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's it's not like the beautiful little tamales that are made by abuelas in the back rooms of Mexican restaurants. These are extruded by a machine, cut into like little cigars, put in the bun, much like a Chicago hot dog, and then dressed much like a Chicago hot dog with the chopped onions and the chilies and the tomatoes. And they add chili, which wouldn't normally be on a Chicago hot dog, but it actually makes this particular sandwich, which is extremely carb heavy, edible. Yeah, I um, I, whenever I bite into one, it's just you know I'm I'm searching for the snap of the dog, and instead you get the gush of the tamal. Um, one of my favorite places for for corn roll tamales used to be Veterans Tamales over on uh -huh. Butcher, and you can still see the sign on the side of the building. The ghost sign is still there. Um, okay, so let's move on to one uh, that is a favorite in Chicago. So Pizza Puff, um, strangely, I've been living in Chicago my whole life, and I never had a Pizza Puff, and but I loved, loved the story behind them. It turned out um, Elisha Shabazz was uh, a, an Iranian, a Syrian Iranian who moved to Chicago at the turn of the century, and what did he, um, what, did, what was his business? He sold uh, push carts for hot dogs to people. And what his great grandsons told me is he would take an old uh, baby buggy, he would put some burners in it, and that became a hot dog push cart. He also sold the equipment that hot dog sellers would uh, would would use. And he would go around to all of his um, clients and say, okay, you got to pay me for the rental of your stuff this month. One day he got to one of the client's houses and uh, the wife said, I'm sorry, he's dead, and I have no money to pay you for this rental. Um, but what I can give you is this recipe for corn roll tamales. Um, and he took that, he incorporated it into what he sold to his hot dog customers, and he started a company called Il Taco. No, that's not a place where you get sick on tacos, but we got all the jokes ready to go. 
It, um, it is the Illinois Tamal Company, and that is still their top seller. No, it's not their top seller. It was their top seller for a while, where they would uh, sell these corn roll tamales to the hot dog stands, until one day in around the late 60s, um, one of the sons, or it was the grandson, who was going around and delivering hot dog equipment, which now would be sold to standalone places, no more baby buggies, um, said, you know, th these new pizzerias are just killing me. What can we do to compete with the pizzeria? And he said, well, let me let me put my thinking cap on and let me think about something. So at the Illinois Tamal Company, they started, um, or Tamale Company, they started, you know, working on different ways that they could make pizza. And what they came up with was take a flour tortilla, put some tomatoes in probably the same meat that they were putting in their tamales um, inside there, maybe some cheese, wrap it up and see if we can um, get that so that it won't explode in a deep fryer so that it will actually like cook and come out and be delicious. He said it took a few years, but they found something that would do that. And it's, it's amazing that today it still looks like someone just took an old flour tortilla and wrapped it the exact same way that first guy probably did it. And, you know, with stuff that's overlapping in areas, they just don't care. Um, and and it's a huge seller. Um, when I was trying to get the story out of the great grandkids during the pandemic, they kept saying, call back next week. We're in the middle of this big lawsuit uh, with a company that's trying to use our name. We can't talk right now. I'm like, okay, I'll try calling back next week, next week, next week. Finally, they completed the lawsuit and they were able to tell me their story. To the victor goes the story. Could it have been someone else? I don't know, but they're the last people making it and they got a really good story. Um, and, and and they won the lawsuit, which they say proves that they're they're the folks who did it last. Um, but in, in the process of, of writing the book, I said, you know what, I got to actually try this. So I did. I you know went down to the local hot dog stand by Wrigley Field. I can't remember what it's called. Um, and I got it. And I was like, wow, nobody told me that when you deep fry these, um, the, these basically flour tortillas, they get sort of crispy and 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 flaky like almost like a puff pastry and so i had it with you know a salad and some wine you're not supposed to do it that way i have been told that the totally classic way to eat it is covered in mild sauce but a lot of people think everything should be covered in mild sauce um but it, that is actually a delicious way to eat it all right so um so dave do you want to go italian beef from a lord uh we can um why don't we just br briefly go through italian beef you know i i had my first a pizza puff when writing the manuscript for this book as well, because I had mistakenly thought that that uh, pizza puffs were the same as pizza rolls uh, by Totino. Totino. You know, yeah, and I thought the same yeah. thing. Yeah. And I had had those before, so well, I don't need to try that again. But I I like the pizza puff quite a lot, and I think it's cool that they're putting different ingredients in the in the puff now, so that you can have it with. Oh my gosh, you've got like you know thirteen different flavors, and right. the first was pork but like all the other enduring chicago classics now the default is beef mm -hmm. suitable for all people who aren't vegetarian or vegan um the, the italian beef we can do this pretty quickly as i think that most most in the audience here are familiar with what an italian beef is we had our book launch party at uh al's number one beef on taylor street which I am fairly convinced. I mean, finding the originator of these foods is no easy task because success has many fathers and mothers, right? A lot of people will claim to be the inventor once the sandwich is achieved or the food has achieved popularity. I'm pretty sure it was uh, Al Ferrara at Al's number one beef or what became Al's number one beef that came up with the idea of selling the Italian beef sandwich, making it a menu item. Now, the sandwich itself and Al Pacelli, who's, uh, or excuse me, Chris Pacelli, whose father worked with uh, Al Ferrara, said that uh, it, this probably started, and others have said this as well, it probably started with peanut weddings in Little Italy in Chicago, where because these were immigrants, like my, my grandfather, who came and settled on Taylor Street for a little while when he came from Naples, uh, didn't have a lot of money for weddings. So what they did, they had these, pe what were called peanut weddings, and some people say that peanuts were served there. Other people say, no, it was only because they only had, you know, a little bit of money to buy food. I suspect that latter reason is the more accurate one. So they didn't have a lot of money. What did they do? They had a big piece of beef. They had some bread, sliced the beef really thin, put it in the bread, put a bunch of gravy on it, which 
incidentally, probably increase the weight of that sandwich by two or three times, literally. I mean, it just becomes much heavier when you put gravy on it, uh, or jus, if you call it that. Um, and they served it. And this guy, Al Ferrara, started selling beeves as a front for a gambling operation. Uh, Al Pac uh, sorry, Chris Pacelli said that it was his father who started working for Al. And Al was, uh, he had, he, as Chris Pacelli said, he did this, that, went to jail for a little while, came out, wanted to start a business. He had some buddies who, he, who <laughs> Chris Pacelli referred to as half-assed mafia guys, who uh, wanted to gamble. That, that was something they, they wanted, that was their pastime. But they couldn't do it in, in the open because, of course, like now, it was illegal. So they needed a front. So Al Ferrara started making the beef sandwiches as a front for a gambling operation. And Chris Pacelli told me re last summer, I think it was, that this was the start of places like Carms and other beef stands in Chicago, too. I can't attest to that. I, this is the documentation, certainly, that's going to support that. But that these were fronts for Italian guys, half assed Italian guys, who wanted, wanted to gamble and needed something to sell so it would look like a legitimate business. Of course, on top of the sandwich is jardiniera. Uh, it's a Chicago condiment because in Chicago, jardiniera is made with oil uh, and vinegar frequently. At Al's number one, they just use the oil, no vinegar. And the vinegared version of vegetables is called soto aceto in Italy. There was such a thing for centuries before. It was a way of preserving vegetables, add some oil, last a little longer. It also adds kind of a tangy touch, like a pickle. Uh, but at Al's, they just use, uh, well, they just use oil and they just use celery in it, which is kind of, and, and some, and some pepper, uh, spices, of course. But celery is the main vegetable, which I happen to like. Their, uh, their jardiniere is some of my favorite. By the way, when did Al's start selling? It was like 1936, 30, I believe. Thanks. Is celebrating their 80th this year? Um, oh, yeah, right. 85. 85. 85. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, Kathy, you shared with me the name of a scholar. Was it Tony, I want to say Bocatini? Oh, oh to Tony Puccini. Who spoke to our, uh, my former colleague and friend, um, uh, Kevin Pang, for his Italian beef episode. And he posited that this was actually a, a, an old Neapolitan recipe. Interesting theory, and that and the people from a village where he found a cookbook that had something similar to Italian beef in it, that a lot of them were in Chicago. I, I tend to think like, well, then why wouldn't they have brought that to any other part of the United States where Neapolitans oh. or people from the village went to? Mm -hmm. Unclear. Yeah. Um, well, but, and, and, and in fact, if anybody wants to, I, I, there's the to the Kevin Payne version, but Tony did an extended talk on this right here on Culinary Historians several months ago, and the video's up there as well as the podcast. A very bright and knowledgeable guy. Yeah, so I mean, it, it could have had many fathers. But um, but I, I love all these stories. I love the mobster story that, hey, it was a front for, for a bookie operation, but we made so much money on this and we didn't want to go to jail. So we kept the sandwiches. We got rid of the bookie. Go back to jail. Yeah. <laughs> back to jail. Um, okay. So let's move on to another one of mine. Um, so who knows? Well, okay. We're not in a room together. So maybe you can put up your hands if you know what this is. Can we put up? I don't know how you put up hands. There's a, there's a label on it, Monica. Oh, darn it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is the Akutagawa. You put the uh, pronunciation on uh, Akutagawa. So there's a guy named George Akutagawa who used to go into a joint called Hamburger King. Some people call it Chester's because a guy called Chester bought it after the Sato family. Um, some people call it Sonia's because Sonia bought it after Chester. It's still there today, owned by a guy named Jacob, who we ran into yesterday, and he has renamed it Rice and Bread. So it's this little place in Wrigleyville, 
from when Wrigleyville was a very Japanese neighborhood. After, um, so when I wrote about this, I took it as an opportunity to talk about how so many people were forcibly relocated after forced internment to Chicago because they're like, you're not going back to California to hang out with your pals and uh, plot God knows what. You are going to go to these new places. And they had to sign something that said they would do their best to become Americans and not congregate with a whole bunch of Japanese. So what did the Sato family do? Um, they said, oh, well, we're opening a place called Hamburger King. Doesn't that sound American? We're going to have hamburgers and french fries, but we're also going to have um, some little pickles, sometimes cucumber pickles, the daughters told me, and we're always going to make a lot of rice. But what did they do with the rice? They put gravy on it. They became like rice and gravy in a bowl for 25 cents, a big bowl of it uh, you could get to really stick to your ribs. And the daughters of the, of the inventor told me, you know, this was a place for working class families. This was a place where the Cubs managers would come every morning with their cigars and the newspapers and scream about the column and said about them. But it was, it was a place for everyone. And their father would wake up early at 5 a.m. to get breakfast ready for folks. But he also had a, but he also, he would work in the mornings and he'd watch the Cubs games two doors down at the Nisei Lounge. And sometimes the daughters would have to drive him home. But he had a pal named George Akutagawa. They said he was a businessman. He'd come in in suits. He was a Hawaiian, a Hawaiian Japanese because the um, oh. those had come here too. So the local moko theory is very clear here. And he, um, and he'd say, you know, hey, I've had a lot to drink and I'm really hungry. Can you can you make me this thing? Can you take some stuff that you've already got? Green peppers, onions, hamburger meat, but also bean sprouts. And can you crack an egg over it and give it to me? Well, George Akutagawa would eat this every day. And folks started saying, hey, what's he eating? And they said, I don't know. We'll just call it the Akutagawa. And everybody started ordering it. And even though the restaurant has gone through four owners today, it's still a huge seller. And other cooks who have eaten at that restaurant have taken it to their places. So you can still get it at the Fullerton, uh, Fullerton Diner, I believe, Fullerton and Ashland. Um, there was another small place in Rogers Park where another cook went. So where they call it the Octa, like, um, like uh, octopus, the Octagawa. Um, and so that was one of the criteria for us, like it can't just be served at one place. And so I believe it was a way to still be Japanese at a time when you were told, stop being so Japanese. And I love that it's still there today. Is it the most delicious thing in the world? Who's to say? I had uh, a plate of it last night, right before the Seder. <laughs> yeah, oh really, that's great. It was, it was, why do we eat the bitter Akutagawa tonight? Um, so you know, why, um, like if you put some kimchi on it and some uh, gochujang, which they have there now because it's become more of a Korean American place, it's delicious. But I, I just love that. And I think so, so, so the theories are that it might be an echo of loco moco. Moco loco? Loco Moco, I believe it is, yeah. Which is a sort of a sort of a hopple popple. You know, it's sort of funny that hopple popple dishes all have those same sort of names. Gravy um, and rice and a hamburger on top, right? Yeah, I mean, that's right. Uh, from Hawaii, or the Hawaii. I'm thinking it could be a bit of um, an echo of okonomiyaki, which basically means how you like it. You know, just put some stuff in eggs. Um, either way, I love that it, it really represents this time when there was this big Japanese American population in Chicago told not to be so Japanese, but they found some ways to be sort of Japanese. So that's that. Where should we go next, David? Uh, you you want to do Malort? I mean, just as a, a quick breeze through that. And thank you, Kathy, for including this uh, advertisement uh, that plays on the kind of traditional knuckle-headed machismo that I think fueled the consumption of Malort for many decades. Um, if you've had Malort, you know that it's a bitter sip. Uh, it's it's not, honestly, I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it's that good either, but it's a, um, it's a, a brandy that's wormwood forward. That is the key flavor in there is wormwood. And wormwood is an herb that grows in many parts of the world, including Sweden, which is where Mr. Jepson, the originator of Malort, came from. And in fact, Malort in Swedish means wormwood. Now, wormwood was also a key ingredient in um, absinthe. And that is why absinthe in its original form was banned in Europe and the United States for many years, because it was believed 
the wormwood, or actually a chemical called thujone in the wormwood, would drive you mad and blind and homicidal. Because there was a story of a French guy who drank it, drank too much of it, went crazy, and started murdering his family. Uh, terrible story. Sorry to bring it up. Um, it was later determined that that was not true, that Thujon did not have that power to, to derange men's minds and make them crazy. But Chicagoans are still kind of crazy about it, usually because they like to, it's it's fun to, some people claim they like Malort, it's true. Others don't pretend to like Malort, but if a friend comes in from out of town, a tourist in other words, they will ask, you know, hey, can I buy you a shot of Malort? Chicago's own spirit? Oh, sure, why not? And then the friend will take a sip of it. And when they take that sip, you pull out the camera, take a shot of it, post it on Instagram, hashtag Malort face. And if you go on Instagram and search hashtag Malort face, you'll see a lot of people who looked a little like Monica in the studio a few weeks ago when she had her first taste of Malort. What did you, you didn't like it very much, did you, Monica? Well, I mean, I found it too, I like bitter, but I found it a little too bitter. Um, but I've, I've been told you have to have it at least three times and then you start loving it. So I got two more times to go. Tremaine Atkinson of uh, CH Distiller that makes my Lord, I'm sure would encourage you to have at least three, three sips of it. I ran into him the other day and I said, you know, this has got to be a case study in some business textbook because this is a, a, a spirit, a product that's marketed based on its repugnance. It's based on the idea that it's not very good. And yet people buy it and sales are going up. And F, uh, Tremaine told me that, in fact, he did just give a talk at, uh, I think it was DePaul Business School, where he explained to people about their strategy, which was to maintain the more tradition of its awfulness, because that's what sells, which is amazing. You don't usually market a product based on its undesirability. Monica? So Ben, it's good. We're going to be doing um, uh, a literary festival in Champaign-Urbana in September that's sponsored by Malort. So I think we'll know. Um, I guess I, I taught with the kids. Sorry, I put a lozenge in. I'm still suffering from COVID, which should make you happy that we're doing this remotely. Mm -hmm. Not make suffering. I'm just a little. Okay. So next up for me is gumpong chicken wings. Um, I've been eating these for years without having any idea that they were invented in Chicago until I started interviewing the folks at Great C. Some people say Great C, some people say Great C. That's written both ways, one on the sign, one on the um, on the menus. And I believe when I asked someone to translate the Chinese in there, it's not Korean, they're ethnically Chinese Koreans, um, they said it's C's, or maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the way this started is um, there, uh, there, was, there was a, a, a big drought in Shandong, which is the northeastern part of China. And so a lot of people moved to uh, to Korea. A lot of Chinese moved to Korea. They didn't have a lot of job possibilities, so many of them opened restaurants. And that developed something you find in a lot of countries, which is Chinese cuisine adapted for that particular nation. You know, you've got Chinese American food, you've got Chinese Mexican food. I just saw a thing on PBS about that um, over the weekend. You get Chinese Cuban food. This was Chinese Korean food. So Chinese Korean food would often be spicier. They would end up using um, gochugaru, which is the um, like the big bags of cayenne pepper. So they would take like a soup called um, jampong, and it, that would be like a noodle soup in China. But it's red when it goes into Chinese Korean restaurants because they put a, put a bunch of gochugaru on there. So this was a dish that actually meant eight piece chicken, gampongi. And you take a whole chicken, you chop it up, you cook it with garlic and peppers. It was a pretty popular dish. But in the 19, in the late 70s and early 80s, when um, a lot of Koreans, but also ethnically Chinese Koreans, moved to the United States, they brought this part of their culture with them. And suddenly you saw all these restaurants opening up near Korean American communities that had the word Man Manchurian or Peking or Beijing in their names. And you're like, that's weird. And, or Mandarin. And you'd say like, okay, they seem like Chinese restaurants, but they also sometimes will serve me um, the turnip kimchi. Um, sometimes they'll also have, um, why can't I remember the name of the word, the yellow pickles. There are two different words for them. I'm just, just both of them are escaping me right now. And, and and a lot of Koreans go in there. You're like, what is happening here? These were ethnically Chinese Koreans who had moved into these restaurants. So Great Beijing, VIP on Montrose, um, Great Seas, um, and Peking Mandarin. 
So Peking Mandarin and Great Seas were about four blocks from each other on Lawrence, separated by Kimball. And, um, and, and according to the owner of Great Beijing on Peterson, um, his, grand, his, his uncle over at, Great, at Peking Mandarin was like, you know what? These crazy Americans, when I go to the butcher, they want to charge me all this money for chicken breasts, but they're practically throwing away the wings. What is up with that? We Asians, we love the wings. Why are they throwing away the wings? You know what? I need to save some money. So I'm buying all wings for like a penny a wing. And I'm going to make this dish that we would normally make with eight pieces of chicken with just wings. He started it. He has, you'll notice his, his, this sauce is sort of clear and red. His is more like ketchup, more like barbecue sauce. He started making those wings and then covering it in, in a sauce that was a little saucier, probably made with gochugaru, um, over in the restaurant still there at this old diner that he took over and turned into Peking Mandarin restaurant. And then this guy down the way in the family, I can't remember what their last name is, but you guys probably know it. Um, they said, wow, he is doing a bang up business um, with these wings, but they are super messy to eat. So why don't we, okay, they said, why don't we take them, at least this is what the daughters tell me. And um, so it was Sing Sang, Sing, his uncle, Kao Sing Sang, who made them at, at Peking Mandarin. But then the, the Tao, the Tiao family, they said, let's take them, let's, let's make this sauce a little more like sweet and sour sauce, and let's French these things so that they're easier to eat. That took off like crazy too. And then now you find them all over the country where it's just done with wings. It's sold in Korean restaurants and especially ethnically Chinese Korean restaurants. Um, and you know, the, the rest is history. They're delicious. I love them. Yeah. And, um, and they're Chicago. So, David, what should we talk about next? Let's go down to the simple uh, Maxwell Street Polish down there. All right. You could hardly imagine a simpler sandwich here. It's a Polish sausage, pork, not beef. I talked to Jim Christopoulos, uh, the current owner, and uh, I, I believe the grandson of the original Jim, of Jim's original, which was once located on the corner of Halstead and Maxwell Street, dead center in uh, the Maxwell Street market. And I remember going to Maxwell Street sometime in the 60s. I went with a buddy to get an old carburetor that he could put in his 49 Ford. And uh, we did find the carburetor amazingly enough. But I remember standing across the street from Jim's and thinking how wonderful it smelled. Mostly, I think, because of the onions that are sitting on the griddle all day long, kind of bubbling along in the fat rendered from the sausage, which, as I mentioned, is a pork sausage, not beef. Uh, there was, as my, they do have all beef me. versions. They do have all beef versions that they sell there. They do, and what uh, Jim Christopoulos said was, he doesn't. He he serves it because he has to. I mean, some people don't want to eat pork. Totally understandable. Uh, he thought that the beef version tasted too much like a hot dog to him. Uh, so he he prefers. In fact, he used to, he said when he was younger, he used to have a double of these, like two two sausages in one bun. Uh, it was still with the onions, just as traditionally was done on Maxwell Street, and sport peppers, which they cure on site at Jim's Original, which is now located overlooking the expressway. Uh, it's about a mile or so from the original Jim's Original. On uh, Union. And, pardon me. On Union. On Union. Thank you. Um, and I asked, uh, I asked Jim what he thought, excuse me, Chris, what he thought, what his best seller was. And he said, oh, undoubtedly, the Maxwell Street Polish. That's what everyone wants. And the reason he gave was that, like, much food can be quick, filling, and delicious. <laughs> That's what people are looking for, especially at 2 a.m. in the morning, which used to be a time you could go and get something at Jim's original, but under the Lightfoot administration, they shut that down. They thought it was creating a crime, which it could have been, you know, I, I don't really know what the crime stats were for that area, but they ruled that uh, they had, I think they have to close at midnight now, but they can open at six. And the place is usually pretty busy, um, but yeah, gone is that feeling of going up there at two in the morning with a bunch of other people kind of swaying around, looking for a little belly ballast to sail home on. Um, yeah, I really like it. 
why is it a, what makes it uniquely Chicago? Well, it's called a Maxwell Street Polish, um, which is maybe a lame reason for designating it uniquely Chicago. But they only Maxwell Street is, of course, in Chicago, and the Maxwell Street Polish was born uh, on Maxwell Street, probably because. Or one reason could be because Maxwell Street was close to the Union Stockyard, so it was conveniently located for getting meat scraps, turning them into sausage, and selling them to hungry working people. You know, it's funny that Macedonians made the Polish. Um, I, I was recently in Marseille visiting my son, and um, and I was on a train, and I met a guy from Poland, and he said, oh, what is the food like in Chicago? And I said, well, you know, and I didn't know if it would offend him. I said, one of our most famous dishes we just call a Polish. And he kind of looked at me and he said, yes, I've heard about it. And I've heard it doesn't, it doesn't compare to Polish sausage. I'm like, yeah, look, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and people from out of town, when, when we say, well, I'll have two Polishes, they're like, what did you just say? And we just don't realize how weird it sounds. How common um, it is to call it a Polish, yeah. Yeah, yeah like Wacker Drive. People like laugh. Um, okay, so let's go to this next one. So you might think you know everything there is to know about gyros or gyro or gyro or gyros. Uh, you can say it either way. South side, it's definitely gyro. It's uh, funny aside, uh, I was interviewing all of the, uh, the mayoral candidates and um, I said to them, you know, cub socks, blah, blah, blah. And when I said, I said, do you say gyro or do you say gyros or gyros? And Sophia King said, oh, I say Yeros. And Jamal Green came up. He's like, I taught, I said to Sophia, what are, who are you kidding? You know it's Gyro. Why are you saying Gyros like you're so north side? So oh, north anyway. side. North side accent. Yeah, total north side. If you're like truly south side, it's Gyro and Gyro sauce only. Um, anyway, so no matter what you call it. It is spit roasted meat that in Chicago most of the time is a uniform cone of meat that is our innovation. In, in Greece, some of you probably know, but gyros is a pork dish. It is a it's stacked whole muscle meat on a spit, much like uh, pastor. But in Chicago, um, I talked, to, so so there are many fathers of this. Lots of people claim they're the ones who invented the Chicago style gyros. And you know what I really learned? It was probably a guy named John Garlic, a white guy, a non-Greek guy named John Garlic in Milwaukee that probably mass produced the first one. But he ended up disappearing. I think he was a Cadillac salesman. Um, and then he ended up opening up a restaurant. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Milwaukee's restaurant where they had live dolphin shows inside the restaurant. Anyway. But I digress. Um, it was um, a few a few different people in Chicago said they made it, but I I focused on the Kronos company because um, they ended up uh, sort of merging with another one of the biggest companies. And this guy didn't say that he actually invented it. Alexander the Greek probably invented it when he asked his soldiers to take their swords and spear some meat and turn it over the fire. But um, Peter Parthenus, he was, he said, I was, um, he was like, I was fresh Greek and I was living in, uh, in uh, going to school at UIC and I was an engineering major. So I would eat at these restaurants and they said, hey, this uh, rotisserie I've got, it's not working and I can't get any good parts. Can you fix it for me? You're an engineer. So he said he kept trying to fix it and fix it. And he said to them, why don't I just make one here? So he was in his Lincoln Square basement and he perfected the rotisserie for this. And at this time, all the um, restaurants in Chicago had started just making these patties and stacking them themselves in the kitchen. And he said he, he was selling them from restaurant to restaurant, these, these rotisseries. And he's like, what am I doing? If I sell this rotisserie, I sell it once. But if I sell the cone, I sell it every single week because as he was doing these demonstrations, he would show them, okay, here's how to make the cone and here's how to do this. And he said, I could make these better. So and he said that it became a specialized thing to get a guy who knew how to stack them. And he said, I can make it for you. I can make it cheaper. And his big innovation was when he said, I stopped asking my guys to, you know, make a patty packet, packet, packet. And we realized we could make it into sort of a slurry and then put it in this pressurized cone-shaped thing, pour it in, pressure cook it, 
and then have a uniform thing with uniform spices. You know, when you get these people who make them on their own, some parts are going to be saltier, some are going to be more garlicky. This, you can mix it all together. And that's what he did. He made a company and then he joined in with John Garlic in Milwaukee and he got his facility and that's how he started Kronos. And all of the big companies that made them have been consolidating and Kronos is now one of the big three and they're all in the Chicago area. The first one he shipped off in Greyhound bus to, um, to Atlanta, Georgia. And um, he said, and I said, you know, he's like a really rich man now. And he said, I said, are you surprised that there are all these like, you know, you can go to middle America and they're like, hey, you want the gyro omelet? Or you want a gyro cheeseburger or gyro salad? He's like, no, that's not, the, that's not, the, no at all. Every time I was trying to sell this, I would tell them, hey, make a cheeseburger, make a salad, make an omelet. And um, I'm like, wow, you really, you pushed it. He's like, I pushed it all the time. And I told him, here was my, here was, I can't do his accent. I'm probably like not supposed to do a Greek accent. <laughs> here's what my selling point. I said, Giros, you can turn a profit. But I'm bummed. And so um, that's how Chicago became the center of, of sort of industrial gyro making that allowed it to go to middle America, that allowed it to just be shipped everywhere and, and and made into this very uniform, affordable product with mostly beef, a little bit of lamb. Where do you want to go? Oh, let's see. Um, how about taffy grapes? That's a favorite of mine. Taffy <laughs> That's toward the bottom. Bottom taffy grapes. All right. What the heck are these? What are they covered in? Where do I get them? <laughs> Good questions, Monica. I'm glad you asked. Uh, what are they? They're green grapes, and they can be dipped in white chocolate or icing or dark chocolate or cake or just about anything that will hold hold to the grape and then will hold nuts sprinkled on top. Uh, where can you get them, you ask? Well, I got these at a Baba's Steak and Lemonade place on Madison Street. There are several on that stretch from Oak Park into the city. And they're right, they're usually right by the cashier. So as you're buying your steak and lemonade and you're thinking, God, I'd like to get something for dessert, there are the taffy grapes sitting there. Now, why do they call it taffy grapes? Pardon Slide me? a little more money under that bulletproof glass and then you get Yeah, right, right. Um, the, uh, they're, called, they're called taffy grapes. I believe, I mean, I've never seen this written down, but I'm just speculating here. I think I'm right. Uh, just like taffy apples, these are a fresh fruit covered in like a candy coating with nuts on top, just like Chicago's affy apples. Uh, we've made these at home. A couple of weeks ago, we made a few dozen. They're so, And they can only be made by hand. I don't think there's a machine yet devised that can make taffy grapes because you have to dip each grape into the chocolate, the icing, whatever you're using, sprinkle nuts, and then set it on like a, a cooling tray and let the let the icing harden. Uh, I think they're just fantastic. They they give the illusion of having a healthy snack after eating a, a sweet steak or a, or a basket of Harold's fried chicken. I think they're they're very good. That was my I didn't know anything about taffy grapes before we started writing the book, and I bought them several times several times. And now that I know I can make them at home, that's what we do. Okay, let's do a lightning answer these questions. Um, so, so someone wanted to see the table of contents. I'm not like, this is so primitive. We're over here. You can't really see it actually. Um, but I can. Kathy has a listing at the beginning, I, doesn't she? I did have that list. You know, it was like one of the first slides that showed most of the items. Here we go. Here we go. Right there. All yeah. right. That's only missing the first five items. Okay. I'd love to, I'd love to know who's eaten all of these. Um, you can like put in the thing. I, I've eaten them. Um, so, okay, so answer some of these questions, please. Show the table of contents. Um, shrimp dissolve. I've heard that it is a Chicago invention. Is that true? And if so, by whom? Dave, you want to take that? Uh, Let's yeah, the, the, the fifteen second answers. These were the the De Jong brothers at the turn of the century were the first people to put shrimp de Jong on the menu. They were Belgian Belgian brothers who served this at the uh, Columbian Exposition of 1893, and it was a hit, so they started De Jong's Restaurant, which is, I think it's right, was right across from the Palmer House. 
Okay. Uh, and, and, and yeah. And so, but we, we should have a disclaimer. Um, the, the recipe in here probably should not say 17 <laughs> cups of breadcrumbs. Uh, maybe like one cup of breadcrumbs. Well, oh no, if what I what I was what I put in the book was what is believed to be the original De Jong brothers recipe for shrimp de Jong, which as Monica points out, has a stunning amount of breadcrumbs, not just breadcrumbs, but like two sticks of butter, a stick of margarine, four, 14 cups of breadcrumbs for like 10 shrimp or something like this. But that was the recipe that allegedly came from the son of the man who served shrimp de jong at the, the, the chef who prepared shrimp de jong at the de jong restaurant. And uh, it was printed in the Tribune and that's my story or their story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> oh, okay, because they've had a test. It, Okay, I think Kathy, at the next um, culinary historians meeting, you should make the recipe as as stated to see how it turns out. Okay, oh, <laughs> God. Um, don't invite me. <laughs> okay. Jason Holm or Heim, um, have you heard that Lakeview in the 19th century was a big celery growing region, hence celery salt on Chicago style hot dogs? That's exactly the supposition that I put in the book. That came from hot dog scholar Bruce Craig. Yes, uh, because of our sandy soil in Chicago, we were an ideal spot to grow celery. Celery was a huge craze uh, around the turn of the century. We made a lot of money. We had the railroads to send it out to all parts. Kalamazoo ate our bacon on it. Um, is that the, is that the word? They they stole our lunch on it. They became <laughs> ate, ate our lunch, I think is the our lunch, right? <laughs> and now Florida and I believe Texas are the big celery growing regions, but we were that at the time. And some people think, yeah, that's why it's in the Darden era too. Um so by the way, that same area was also a big cabbage growing region. Oh, wasn't there yeah. quite a field called Cabbage Town, or am I thinking of it? Yes, other? yes. Okay. But that so, same area. I've heard the Yodos machine was an engine was engineered and invented as a vert vertical roaster spit in Chicago, and he now lives in Inverness. That's probably Peter Parthenus. Yep. Um, Marty, all we need is mental therapy. I should try Portillo's and Niles when you come to visit. Okay, that's probably not a question. Love Yodos. You wrote <laughs> the Polish at Portillo's today. Um, such a great book project. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. I forgot about Pietro Uno. Um, Kathy, are you seeing, regarding, regarding the origins of deep dish pizza, what did you discover? Perhaps if we had a document showing Pizza Reno's original owner and a contemporaneous newspaper article describing that owner. Oh, Peter Regas. Do you want to, do you want to pop Oh, on? yeah. Can we unmute Peter for him to uh, give us a brief, brief. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll ask him to unmute. Just Okay. Even though the sandwiches are often found in Puerto Rican neighborhoods, there are suggestions in the book. I live within walking distance. Support your local cardiologist. Yes, these are often um, very, um, very not so healthy dishes. Well, high calorie. And I think a lot of these were made for working people, you know, people who have, want to grab something at lunchtime and then go back to manual sort of work. Not sit at a desk all day like we do. Well, I mean, but also a lot of them are very, very sweet. And what we found is that actually sugar is terrible for your cardiovascular health. So for some, for instance, the um, the lemonade and steak and lemonade, it is the sweetest thing. Like it's lemonade. And then on top of that, which two syrups do you want to go in it? Um, and you so- You can two syrups? They told oh, me I, I only added one. I, if only I had known. Oh yeah, well, I got to add two syrups. Now. And I was not able to have more than two sips. Um, That's about, yeah, my um, teeth hurt. Mm -hmm. Peter's, Peter Regas is, on, is uh, ready to talk. Great. Okay, tell us about the origin hey, of the dish. Um, well, while we're waiting, this is so, I got three colors. I got three syrups in my steak and lemonade. And maybe while we're waiting for Peter, um, I can tell you, steak and lemonade, um, I, I went in search of all the, you know, I had a question, what's with all these steak and lemonade stands on the south side? You north siders are probably like, what the heck is steak and lemonade? It is um, a sort of Philly cheese steak um, that's served on the south side with this, which is what they call lemonade. 
And so I finally tracked down a Jordanian American who told me he invented it because he he wanted to make something like the Philly cheesesteak. And then he made he put these slushies basically on the menu. And he said they went together like mom and pop, stick and lemonade. And he said that um, this was actually based on a Jordanian, famous Jordanian lemonade. I didn't believe him until I went to a place in uh, Mount Prospect. I believe I had written about it in Axios. And there they had it. It was called Limo, Limo Nona. And it was a famous Jordanian lemonade, also icy like this, like a Slurpee, but it had mint in it. The extra flavor was mint rather than, um, rather than what you have here. Um, so it's super popular. They even have them in Kentucky. They have them in all these other states. They're like, yeah, Chicago style steak and lemonade, right? And then you get nor North Siders who are like, Chicago style, what? what um, yeah. It's it's super interesting. Peter, do we have him on the line, producer? He's here. I have a feeling he might have a problem with his microphone. Okay. But he he has done quite several extensive talks for culinary historians. They're online, we on YouTube on the origins of uh Chicago and New York and other types of pizza so if we can't catch it but peter do try to talk by the way there was somebody also interested in the gym shoe wanted to know what that was about right and we've got a gym shoe is it the last one it's it, no these are in alphabetical order so it's up oh i yeah. see it i see, you, you went past it okay it's two images okay so what's the gym shoe? It's gyros. It's Italian beef and it's roast beef. Um, uh, at one point it was served cold. And I think actually we have a cold and a hot version here. Um, and uh, most of the, the people who told me that they were first, uh, Palestinian Americans and Pakistani Americans said they were first introduced to it as a uh, cold dish when they took over their submarine stand on the south side. You'll find a lot of submarine places on the south side that are owned by Pakistani, Jordanian, Egyptian, um, or Palestinian Americans. Um, but they have um, modified it so that you take all these ingredients and they're not sliced like a hoagie, but they're chopped up into small bits and griddled until they've got these wonderful brown crispy edges. Then you pile them onto a toasted um, roll and then you put on jardinera, you put on gyro sauce. Do not say gyro sauce because no one will have any idea what you're talking about. Gyro sauce and sometimes some cheese. And if you're super lucky and they have some time and they want to take a risk with their deep fryer, they will make you a super crispy gym shoe. That's what it's called, super crispy gym shoe. Peter Engler first told me about this. I didn't think it existed, but I finally found a place that would make it. And it sort of intersects with the Chicago style egg roll. They take all these ingredients, minus the lettuce, I think, roll it up in a giant uh, flour tortilla, gingerly lower it into the fryer, and it comes out as a egg roll this big and then you, they slice it and it is the most delicious most flavor-packed egg roll you've ever had in your life it sounds like a chimichanga <laughs> yeah yeah well, basically it's a, it's a giant chimichanga full of gyros roast beef and italian beef and monica on, on the right there is that karachi style chopping right so i interviewed um abdul wajid and he said um, he said that this is, I said, I said, how much would you say the modern day gym shoe is a testament and was influenced by Karachi style cooking? I said, maybe 50%. He said 95%. I think that's what I have. Mm. Mm. Uh, and because there is a cooking style in, in Karachi called katakat. In fact, you can go to your local, um, South Asian store and you can get katakat spices and it's called katakat because it sounds like this with two cleavers. The chop and you can and when you go to the restaurants you'll, if it's a, if it's a Pakistani one you'll hear it, ch -ch -ch -ch, they're chopping up all of these little bits on the on the griddle in Pakistan it would be hearts brains livers and uh, I can't remember what what other yeah. great it's our hearts brains and livers um, but here it's gyros and roast beef and Italian beef. Um, and it's, it, but the same, same concept. And he says he puts katakat spices on his and it's delicious. Why is it called a gym shoe? The same guy who, who invented steak and lemonade, he, he, he can sometimes stretch a story. He said, I invented it. 
And I said, really? When did you invent it? Uh, 2007. A guy comes through my drive through late at night. He says, hey, man, I am high. Oh, he, he was high on weed. He was high on weed. He says, hey, man, I need something with three meats. He says, oh, what if I throw three meats at a gym shoe? Will you eat that? He says, sure, man. So, so I made him the gym shoe. And I said, that's a great story. And so I checked with Peter Engler, and he said there were sightings way before 2007. So turns out I really couldn't use that story, but I do love recounting it because it kind of shows that you're going to get a lot of people who tell you, hey, I'm the inventor. In fact, I was fooled with the big baby on that one. Um, so, so Peter Regas, obviously audio not working, but he did put a response. He said, Ricardo was the sole owner when it originally opened in December 1943. I'm Additionally, Ricardo, Ricardo's. Yep. Yep. Uh, additionally, in an article in December 1943, Chicago Sun, it describes him training their pizza cook. There you go. And I found, I found an article by my friend um, Paul Galloway where he interviewed Ike Sewell, who kind of cops to the exaggeration. Um, I want to say in the 70s or 80s. So, so Ike, so a lot of people believe it was Ike Sewell who invented it, and he kind of like said he did. But in this article, it's like, okay, yeah, maybe it was you know Rick Ricardo. Um, all right, so let's see what other questions we have. Audio there, there is a question. What is the Palmer House flavor in the rainbow cone? Ah, mm -hmm. that is um, that is cherry and and walnut or cherry and pecan. Right. I'm gonna check my book. Um, and boy, does the family does Lynn Sapp strenuously deny that it has anything to do with Palmer House? It's almost as if the Palmer House came and said, um, "Hey, we think that you guys stole this from us." So what about the Palmer House? For many people, Palmer House, uh, the Palmer House layer of the ice cream, including me, is the most delicious part. Um, why can't I remember? I believe it's cherry and pecan. Um, but most Chicagoans assume the flavor was connected to the famous downtown hotel that was opened in 1875. But Sapp says the flavor arrived with her grandfather when he showed up in Chicago from New York via Ohio and has nothing to do with the hotel. It's a cherry walnut ice cream. And one interesting thing she told me was that the original um, Rainbow Cone actually had a black walnut flavor that was very much in style at the turn of the century, but uh, it got it got ditched. Sorry, walnut maple. Um, but but she said that he, he made it because um, there was really nothing out there in that part of Beverly at the time, just cemeteries, but lots of people who'd go to the cemetery on weekends and then needed a snack on their way home. And he wanted to make a very special snack um, and the only way you could load that many flavors onto one cone was to use a spade that he custom made to kind of slap it on there rather than putting the balls on there. Can I get in a question or a comment? Sure. Of course. I, I, so I read your book, or at least half of it, while dealing with the election the other day. And when I turned to the chapter on Chicago-style egg rolls, you gave me a surprise. I did not expect there's a jerk chicken version of Chicago egg rolls, which means I have to now go eat one to check it out for myself. But how long have these been around? Oh, that I'm not sure about. I don't think it's been very long, but I think the most distinctly Chicago style of egg roll, it also served at Three Kings, and I include a picture of that place on Madison Street in the book. They do an Italian beef egg roll, which has to be the most distinctly Chicago style of egg rolls to put put beef in there. I don't. I did not order that when I was there. They. I don't know if they put jardiniera in it or not. I kind of doubt it. But uh, yeah, you could. I mean, an egg roll is kind of a. You can put anything in it that you care to. Ham and eggs, uh, pizza stuffing, whatever. But by the way, the the picture for that is the top one. Oh, yeah. Right now, mm -hmm. if you want to just quickly show the facade, which was fascinating. And then I grabbed this off their uh, website. But it's 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 this wonderful idea that you can stick anything in there. Um, right. Not anymore, my old colleague at BZ, every time the pot roast egg rolls are on uh, special at this place on the south side that I keep meaning to go to. It's like, Monica, it's the pot roast egg roll day. Um, so someone asks, when did I get COVID? I am not sure when I got it, but the first time I tested positive was on Saturday morning. I had, I had a scratchy throat on Thursday, so I tested 
totally negative. But then by Saturday morning, um, it was testing positive. Luckily, I feel fine, but um, but it, it's not fun. Um, so what other questions do I have? Well, no, you know what? I have a, a great idea. Why don't they go and buy the book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is a marvelous idea, Kathy. <laughs> Well, I don't want to start any um, yes. panic, but we're really running out. Of, we only we only um, printed two thousand six hundred, and the publisher said we are running out fast, so they've got to do a second printing. I think you could still order them on Amazon. You might still find them in stores. A friend went to Barnes and Noble; they were sold out. So well, um, somebody here just asked why there weren't Vietnamese foods, but you had a criteria that you were working with. They had yeah, we, to be invented here and served at multiple restaurants in that version. Can because you, we didn't want to just do like the, a restaurant special. If we were focusing on restaurant specials, we'd have thousands of different restaurant specials to deal with. We wanted food. Know of any, do you consistent. know of any Vietnamese foods that were invented in Chicago that are served in other places? Because we would love to add them. Yeah, definitely. That's a good challenge. Yes. Oh, so we can tell you some of the ones that we'd love to put in the next edition. Um, where's the map of where to find it? Um, well, that's a really great idea. We were thinking of doing an app or some sort of interactive or web thing that would be like, ding, 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 ding. You're within, you know, five minutes of a really good hot dog or something. Um, but uh, we really did this on a shoestring budget, as you may notice from our, our pictures that were all taken by us sometimes with telephones. <laughs> they looked very authentic though well thank you but <laughs> yeah, once you. we once we we let's say you know this does well maybe they'll let us like kind of up our game and maybe someone suggested a coffee table version a coffee table book right someone said tours um that where we could do tours of it and maybe we'll be able to do sort of a better version uh oh did we all lose our here we go um but so 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 uh, david do you want to talk about some ones we might add to the next edition Oh, well, after I had, uh, after the book came out, I got a call from uh, Rob Lapata, who I met on LTH forum. And he said, I guess he had, he had read some, or seen one of the, our television appearances or read about it or something. He said, have you ever heard, heard of the Wapachosa? And I had not heard of the Wapachosa. I Googled around to see what I could find. I didn't find much. But uh, Danny Shapiro, who is at Scofflaw and a few other places, was serving it for a while. And at my understanding, based on what Rob Lapata told me, is that he had found that sandwich somewhere in Chicago and then duplicated it at Scofflaw. And what it is, it's a sandwich, it's in a bun, and it has things like chicken, just regular chicken, plus deviled eggs and fried green pickles. And this is such a classic. It's like like the uh, the uh, gym shoe. It's like a guy behind the counter. What do I have in front of me that I can combine together to make something completely new? It's that's, it sounds like that's what the Wapachosa is. Now it, that, I don't think Wapachosa. Tr my Spanish isn't good enough to figure out to remember whether that's actually a word. But Wapa would mean a very a, a handsome woman, I believe. Um, so Wapachosa is maybe like a pretty girl or something i don't know but yeah it's called a wapachosa that would be one that we will have to investigate before we include it in the book but so the no book, atomic cake so louisa chu took us to task she said why didn't you put atomic cake in there and actually it, it sold in many places around town and i'd considered putting it in there um uh the super taco which is um a pita bread uh that's grilled and then you put um ground beef and then lettuce and tomato and gyro sauce on it um brownie maybe so if you guys have any ideas for other ones that we should uh, yeah definitely definitely but, hot uh, link hot link since you did the jerk you said you did the rib tips hot links really belong they're almost like sister and brother yeah, I mean, in our Axios newsletter, we have an area where we um, tell you all the other little stories that you should uh, you should be reading that week or that day. It's called Tips and Hot Links. But um, bump. Yeah, they. I, I, I think it would be hard pressed. We can investigate it, surely, but hard pressed to prove that that was a Chicago original sausage, the hot link. In other words, I mean, they 
they have them in a number of different states around in the union. So yeah. Yeah, that's, sure that, that's that. okay. It was just a thought. Oh yeah, no, that, thoughts are good. I mean, that's worth worth investigation. For sure. Another big one we talked about was was um mild sauce. And uh and uh, we were gonna go on WBZ this this Friday. I said, look, I got COVID, I can't go in there. But Natalie Moore, my old colleague who was going to interview us, she's like, oh, I want to talk about mild sauce. I quote her in it. I don't think she likes that I have attributed the birth of mild sauce to the West Side because she's a South Sider and there's a little tension there. Um, but I say that a West Sider was the first to create a proprietary version. Uncle Remus. Yeah, Uncle Remus. And, you know, Gus Rickett, who started Uncle Remus, um, who, who came up here in the second wave of the Great Migration, had nowhere to live and uh, was able to start this business um, with a friend who he said was into illegal activities and then his friend died and he was able <laughs> to do the whole business. Um, he, he had Uncle Remus and it wasn't called Uncle Remus. He had this great story in there that um, after the riots, um, uh, after Martin Luther King's death, he went into a sign store, he went in to get a sign and he'd found that there was a sign that said Uncle Remus and the guy who had been thinking of getting it was like, uh -uh, I do not want that sign. I don't want anyone coming and telling me that I shouldn't have this sign. So he's like, I'll buy it. And that's how he got I'll it. I'll name my store, Uncle Remus, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that might be it. And um, and Penelope, thanks for coming out to Volumes. I'm really hoping I didn't get anyone sick there, but I swear I tested right before I got there. And uh, so far, so good. I've talked to a few people who were there and they seem to be okay. I'm still well, fine. And then I'm so glad even though we screwed up on the date, we did the right method of approach using Zoom yes. instead of a live library presentation, mm -hmm. which would have had to get canceled or modified or God knows what, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good Thank you, Monica. You this was fun. This Thank was great you. fun. Bye. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.